Welcome to Tommy Solo's Famous Friends. This is where I get to chat with people I've connected with over the years in the world of arts and entertainment, most of whom are all just a little bit more famous than me. And today, I'm very happy to have with me Indigenous author and believer in miracles, Mr. Richard Van Camp. Welcome to the show, Richard. Tommy Solo, Masi Cho. Thanks for having me, my friend. Well, it's my pleasure. This has been a long time coming because, uh, full disclosure, you kind of grew up with my wife up in the far north in Fort Smith. And yep. uh, uh, this is one of those things that was destined to eventually happen. So I'm really glad we're, we're having this opportunity today. Me too. It was a joy to grow up with Lisa. And I'm glad you two are together. And uh, I wish you all the very best. So Tommy, why did you want me to come on this show? You could have had anybody. You're talking to Everybody and anybody, and he chose, you know, old stinky Van Camp from uh, Fort Smith, Northwest Territories. What's it? What? Well, why? What happened? Well, my wife made me do it. No, I'm kidding. You're as interesting and uh, as fascinating a person as anybody, and your story deserves to be told just as, as well as anybody else's. So I want to start with your latest book, Gather. You've dedicated this to the storytellers, past, present, and future. And uh, at the very beginning, you say that you believe in miracles, and that was uh, somewhat inspired by a story that Thompson Highway told you. What can you tell us about Thompson Highway's story? Well, Tommy, let's start back up in Fort Smith. So I was born September 8, 1971 in Fort Smith, Northwest Territories. Population 2,500. It's officially quadrilingual. So what that means is Chippewyan, Cree, French, and English are spoken at any given time. We're the Métis capital of the Northwest Territory is the gateway capital to the north. And uh, we've got Buffalo 40 miles one way and Bison 40 miles the other way. So we grew up in paradise. Lisa, your wife and I, and all of our friends and family, we, we grew up really in paradise. And when I graduated from high school in 89, I, or actually it was 90, I had to go back for half a semester. Um, when I graduated in 90, I because I had to stay behind, all my peers had left. Lisa and Megan and Sherry, everybody else had a life plan except me, and I really didn't know who or what I was supposed to do or who or what I was supposed to be. I just literally, I knew I wanted to be, I kind of wanted to be a ninja, I wanted to be a break dancer, I kind of wanted to be an astronomer. Um, I loved pop culture, big comic book collector, big movie fanatic. But, you know, you couldn't in those days make, make a living off of uh, your comic books. So... I ended up volunteering to drive the handy bus in our community in Fort Smith, and I ended up driving the elders around. And that was where, Tommy, I was welcomed into into story, into ceremony, into culture, into miracles. And, you know, we had Maria Brown, who was a a Chippewan elder, and she'd been curing asthma in our community using goose grease. And we had Irene Sanderson, who was Cree, and she ended up saving her, her brother. No, that's the Indian way, her cousin, but she would call him her brother. She ended up saving her brother's leg. Uh, he had stubbed his toe and had gangrene. He was diabetic, and like all of us, he stubbed his toe. And he kept believing in the doctors, and they kept putting him on salves and you know powders and pills, and it just was not stopping this infection. And finally, they were going to ship him down to Edmonton and start amputating, and then Irene Sanderson ended up using beaver casters to save his leg. She used Indian medicine to save his leg, and she did. And... I started to drive elders around and they would tell me about, uh, you know, the miracles of their lives, the stories of their lives. And what I realized is that everybody wants to, you know, have their story listened to and believed. And so I ended up buying a little Radio Shack tape recorder for 21 bucks at the drugstore and when it was the drugstore. And also they had a Radio Shack component to the drugstore. And I ended up recording my own elders because I just realized that nobody else was doing this. And and the mistake we make, of course, is we think we always have more time with our icons and our matriarchs and our cultural keepers and our, you know, the people that matter most to us. And I just started recording them with their permission. And I transcribed the stories word for word and I took their portraits and then I made them copies of, you know, what I typed up. And it just became this passion because I realized I was starving for culture and Then I started to meet elders who had passed away and had come back and wanted to share what they'd seen on the other side. And when you listen to the elders, and actually, if you go to SoundCloud, I don't know if you want to put this on your site later, Tommy, but if you go to Richard Van Camp's SoundCloud, you can listen to Glenn Douglas, who was an Okanagan elder. He was 65 in 1992. I actually digitized his tape. He told me a story about being hit with a concussion grenade in the Korean War, and he died. 
he died completely and he saw the other side. But a voice told him that he still had work and he had to come back and he didn't want to come back because he had a lot of survivor's guilt because he'd survived fighting in World War II and uh, he'd seen so much in Korea as well. He had so much remorse for everything that he'd seen, just didn't want to come back. But uh, the voice said, you know, you will be told many times you will never walk again. You will walk again, have faith. You still have work. And he came back. He ended up waking up in his own body bag. And it was a soldier who saw him. Can you imagine waking up in your own body bag, Tommy? Not on your life. No, that's, that's life. crazy. Wow. Yep. Well, okay. So, and then Maria Brown had told me a similar story of her passing in her sleep. And she saw heaven. She saw her late parents and her, her late husband. And, and she was the one who told me that heaven is like West Edmonton Mall. She said, there's, everyone's young. Everyone's happy. There's many floors and everyone's visiting. But it was the, the same voice that, that spoke to Glenn Douglas it was the same voice with the same message that said, Maria, you can't stay. You still have work. You can't stay. And she didn't want to come back because she said, it's all love. It's all love. When we lose our loved ones, they're home. And when I started to record these elders, I have 24 elders recorded and transcribed with their permission. That was really what set me on my course as, as a human being to work hard, to live a life of service, not here to take, you're here to, to share what you have. And that's really what Gather is all about is it's a handbook on how to gather stories, how to gather recipes, how to gather what you need for your own sweet heart medicine and soul medicine. It'll help carry you not only through this pandemic, of course, but it'll carry you through heartbreak and it'll, it'll carry you hopefully to forgiveness or maybe to forgiveness others are or maybe even forgiveness of yourself. And uh, we're really proud of it. It's published by the University of Regina Press. Uh, the books will be out in a couple of weeks, and it's my 25th book in 25 years. It's called Gather, Richard Van Camp on Storytelling. It's part of the Writers on Writing series with the University of Regina Press, and it took me four years to put the whole book together, but really, it's, it's really a life's work because the stories that we chose, like Thompson Highway, for example, share a story about falling down a huge flight of stairs. He just finished performing and uh, he flipped and he was going to land on his neck and he knew it. It was a big staircase and he was wearing the slipperiest shoes and um, nobody's fault. But as he was falling, he thought, this is it. I, uh, this is it. I'm dead. And uh, he was actually caught by four angels. And one of them was his late brother. And they put him down gently. And that's how he opened the book. So this is a book of miracles. This is a book of hope. And I'm really proud of it. I'm, I'm so grateful to the editors who went through all the stories that I've been collecting and they we helped decide which ones would, would speak most to, to most readers. But if you don't believe me, you can go to Richard Van Camp SoundCloud and you can listen to Maria Brown, Shipway and Elder from Fort Smith Seeing Heaven in her own words. The audio is digitized. You can go listen to Glenn Douglas talking about heaven as a soldier. And then uh, you can also listen to Anna Tanasket. Uh, she had her life saved by the little people. And the little people, of course, are little spirits. They're recognized by many cultures all around the world. But there were three men who were drinking. And they knew that she babysat all by herself up in Vernon, B.C. And they were coming for her. And uh, she can still hear the beer bottles hitting the gravel when they opened the doors. And, but it was the little people who saved her life. And you can listen to that audio tape. And we have full permission to share these stories because... What we want is for people to read, gather, and read the stories that are in there, and for someone to sit up and go, that's exactly what happened to me, or that's exactly what my grandma talked about, or that's the voice that spoke to my uncle and told him he couldn't stay and he still had work. It's just a reminder to everybody, regardless of where you are, that, that we are here and we're here to help each other. We're here to leave each person in each place better than we found them. Anyways, I hope you love it. Well, you know, Lisa and I have watched a couple of the movies, um, The Lesser Blessed and Three Feathers, and I know you've got mm -hmm. a couple of other movies out there, and mm -hmm. we've read a few of your books, but the thing that I think is really cool about this one is how it's inspirational, and it starts out with you doing something good for the community, volunteering to drive the elders around, and it's resulted in you having a lifelong career as an author, so I think that is absolutely wonderful. Hands down. And you know what's amazing is Seraphine Evans was uh, one of the elders I had the privilege, and her husband John, of course. So I drove them around in the handy bus because it had a wheelchair lift, and John was in a wheelchair. Just wonderful, just great human beings, beautiful souls. And it was 
actually Joel Evans was her great nephew. I don't even think he was born yet, but he ended up being the star of The Lesser Blessed with Kyla Gordon from Twilight and Benjamin Bratt from Miss Congeniality. And it just shows you what a small world it is. And I'm really excited for Gather to come out because I have a feeling a lot of people, it's going to be a treasure because we, I, don't, I can't remember how, what the exact number of storytellers that we have in there. But it's from right across Canada. And we have Jace DeCorey, of course, from the United States. So I think this is going to be a keepsake for a lot of people because they're going to say, oh, that's, that's Anna, that's my aunt here, that's my cousin. My mom's in there telling her residential school story. It's just a... It's a treasure, and I, I can't wait to hold it. I want to see it. I've actually ordered 300 copies. I've never done this before with any of my books because, um, you know, that's a lot of money to order your own books. But I, I want to hand sell them. I'm so proud. I want to sell them to universities and high schools. I think this is going to be the book that um, is for everyone. Like, Lesser Blessed, obviously, is YA crossover. It's very goth, right? So you don't want grade sixes reading it. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, and then I write baby books as well. So those, you know, teenagers are going to be bored. Graphic novels, I think the kids are going to be bored. But I think that with Gather, this is going to be like what the four hour, you know, remember when Timothy Ferris came out with the 40, what's it called? The four, what, is it the four day work week? I think what so. Did Tim, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I want this to be like the eat, pray, love, but for storytellers and people who are, are looking for, for purpose. And really purpose comes through service. And if, if you're bored out of your tree and if you're lonesome right now, and I know a lot of people are with this pandemic, there are many organizations out there who make it very easy to volunteer. Right. And you know something that I think is another thing that's really cool about this book is the fact that you mention names of places all throughout. And I, you know, just in skimming over the first part of it, I thought, well, West Edmonton Mall, I've been there. You know, Capus Gasing, I've played in Capus Gasing, et cetera. So that's really cool. So the people and the places are going to hit home with a lot of folks. Great. Also, Chetwin, B.C., we had a little miracle story happen in Chetwin, B.C. I was on tour with George Littlechild, one of my biggest heroes. His screen name is Nico Wasis. We have two kids' books out together. And we got to meet the late and great Leo Sabalski. Can I tell you a quick... It's a beautiful story. It's, yep. So Leo Sabalski, the late and great Leo Sabalski, raised a little bit of money and got us up there to do a, a community art show and a creative writing workshop and an art workshop and he was one of those guys who had his, his finger in many little pies in the community. So he helped run the radio station. He was the, the fire chief. He uh, also ran the secondhand store and the laundromat. And he was one of those guys that nobody made a move in Chetwin without him knowing about it. And great guy, funny guy, so funny. Like you just, you couldn't believe, you just couldn't carry a complete sentence without, I would just burst into tears with laughter because he didn't even have to try. He was just naturally a funny guy. But one night we were having supper and I said, uh, you know, how did you end up in Chetland? And he said, oh, he says, you know what? My wife loved it. I, I loved it too. But he says, I showed up and I think it was three days later, there was a knock on the door. I answered it and the guy handed me a hard hat and, and a radio. And he said, congratulations, or a phone radio. It said, congratulations, you're the fire chief. And that was it. And he said, you know, we, we fought fires. And in those days, there were big houses. So when there was a house fire, you sometimes had 14 people displaced with one house. And he said, Chetwin, a long time ago, had, you know, a, the Métis leader, they had the mayor, and they had the chief. But it was really run by this elder. They called her Old Ma. And somebody saved up their money and got her a red phone, just like the president, because when she picked up that red phone, things happened really quickly. So he said after uh, there'd be a little fire, and there'd be a forest fire, there'd be a little garden fire, we'd, we'd put it out, you know, we house fire, we'd put it out. Luckily, he said, we know nobody lost their lives during my time there. And one night he said uh, after a house fire, when she picked up that red phone, they were all taken care of at the hotels and motels. They all had new toothbrushes for the morning. They all had new pajamas. And we were going to figure out housing as time went on. There, you know, first things first, safety. He said it was such a long fire to put out and extinguish properly. He said, I actually fell asleep sitting up holding my coffee cup. And when I opened my eyes, everybody else had left. My whole team had left and old Ma was sewing and she was watching me. And I, he said, I was so embarrassed. I said, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Auntie. He says, I, I'll just go home. He says, no, no, Leo, you did good tonight. You know, you, you helped all those people. Everyone's safe. They're all sleeping. Tomorrow's a new day. 
And he said, well, thank you. He says, yeah, that was a, that was a tough one, but everyone's safe. And thank you for making arrangements for, for the family. And she looked at him and she said, Leo, how are we related? And he said, oh, auntie, he says, I wish I was related to you, but unfortunately, I'm not Cree. I'm not Beaver. I'm not a Creever like you. I'm Ukrainian. And she shook her head at him and she said, Leo, 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 we are all related. We're all family. Give me a couple days. I'll make some calls and I'll figure out how you, I know I'm related to you somehow. He says, well, auntie, if you could figure that out, boy, that would sure open a few doors for me. I notice things go a little easier for people who are related to you. And she says, well, Leo, give me a couple days. I'll figure it out. You go home to your wife and you have a good sleep. And thank you for everything. And I'll probably see you tomorrow. He said, okay. So he got in his truck and drove home, went to bed. Next morning, he says he was crashed out and the phone rang. It was old Ma. And he said, hello, good morning. Auntie, is everything okay? She said, Leo, I figured out how we're related. He said, how? She said, your dog is the son of my dog. <laughs> and he says, you know how many times I use that line to get into parties and exclusive feasts at the fancy side at the restaurant? I'm like, hey, you see that dog there? Old Ma, Auntie's dog. That is the mother of my dog. And I say, why don't you say so, Leo? Come on in. And he said, Chow in BC. Why live anywhere else? You know, he was so in love with the community and the culture. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about this book. No kidding, yeah. And I'm going to have you send me a hard copy and I'll pay you for it. I know you sent me the PDF to preview for this interview, but I do believe in supporting my fellow artists. So, Masi Cho, thank you. Keep me out of the poorhouse. You know, this whole pandemic, the CRA, the GST, and the mortgage companies, did anybody offer you any slack, Tommy? No. Anybody say, you know, it's a pandemic. Why don't we just go half this? No, no. You've got to produce, baby, even got, if we're not touring. I got a $30 rebate from my uh, auto insurance. You know, like, wow. 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 Thanks so wow. much. Yeah, $30. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's right. We'll be, uh, we'll be eating craft dinner for the week. Thank you so much. <laughs> you know, yeah, so don't get me started on those, those big corporate people because yeah. this will turn south real quick. Uh, having said that, you talk about in the gather, you talk about some interesting things about society, about how people are addicted to screens and nobody really listens to each other anymore. And then you go on to give advice to people on how to unplug. Yeah. Well, we've been very lucky. You know, Tommy, our little boy at Zazi has actually, he's been the whole answer because trying to keep up to a, a six-year-old in grade one has been our saving grace. I mean, that's been the medicine of our heart every single day. So I think the pandemic, the answer has always been outside. It's always been outside. So our boy is in, in forest school four days a week. So he's in the bush four afternoons a week. And so we take him. So my wife is with him now. I took him yesterday and I'll take him tomorrow. He was in Jackrabbits. So that's Sunday morning. We signed up for the archery club. So we're out with our bows and arrows and target at the outdoor archery club. We've been outside for hours every single day for the past 365 days, and it's because of our son. And you'll notice we're all so much more relaxed and happier outside. And I'm an extrovert, so I love to, to visit, whether we're on the archery range or we're down at the, the ravine or we're at Tubby Park. I mean, we live in Edmonton, 36 countries, so our street is just filled with other parents and other kids. In fact, we have a cohort family and they were over this morning and the kids were playing together with their masks on and Sally and I maintained our social distance and we just, every day we talk, we visit, we laugh, but it's outside and we have a really conscious effort every day. Leave the phone in your pocket. Obviously you take it because I take a lot of photos with my phone. I've got something like 33,000 photos on my little thumb drive here, but staying outside you know, filling your heart with great conversation, a good laugh every day, great tunes. I've been listening to Windspeaker Radio every day. I, you know, I, my favorite podcast is uh, Phased Out. It's by DJ Acid Wash. And, you know, I've really fallen in love with the Sisters of Mercy all over again. I'm a big Star Wars Micro Machines collector. You know, I've got my own little Facebook group and I follow a couple of other international groups. So it's really been pop culture. You know, I also have quite a few books that are being released. So Angel Wing Splash Pattern just turned 20. So we've just released the 20th edition with a bunch of new stuff in there. And uh, we've reclaimed a Clicho 
children's book by Joe Lazar Zoe from Gamete in the Northwest Territories. It's how frogs saved winter for everyone, and it's at the printers right now. So I've been working on that with Mr. Lazar and the Yellowknife School District for probably three years. And then Gather took four years to put together. And uh, yeah, I've just finished my new novel, Beast. So we're looking for a publisher. And I'm working on another movie with the National Film Board and Amanda Spotted Fawn. So we just had a big read through of the script on Saturday with some elders and uh, you know the creative team with Amanda. So you know, I think another thing is what'll get you through this pandemic is purpose. You know, finding your purpose. What fills your love cup? Focus on that. And one of the things we do is we volunteer to look after a friend's dog because she's starting a new hair salon. So we get Bentley. And I take him for five walks a day. She says Bentley sleeps for a week after he comes back. It's so good. It's good for me because, you know, I, we love dogs. We travel and we, you know, I'm sure we're going to start traveling again with camping. We travel far too much to have a dog. But if you're bored out of your tree, volunteer to walk a dog. Absolutely. Volunteer. That's what Lisa's yeah. job is. She walks dogs every day. And, and we I have bet she's a, happy. Oh, yeah. We have a female black lab rescue. And mm-hmm. she is such a godsend, really, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about some of the First Nation uh, traditional culture. And I spent some time touring on the powwow circuit in northern Ontario. I knew about gifting elders tobacco, but mm-hmm. for people who are uneducated, maybe tell us some of the other things that people, uh, non-Indigenous people, should do out of respect when they're connecting with the First Nations elders? Well, you asked a million dollar question. So, you know, as artists, we borrow all the time. So if somebody, like I was at a concert years ago and uh, nobody would sit down and, and we were in the nosebleeds and I just couldn't believe that for three hours we were all going to have to stand when the whole point was sit down, just relax. Anyways, so I said to the people in front, I said, excuse me, can you please have a seat? There's nobody in front of you. And they just looked back at me and started laughing. And uh, they just, I think they stood even taller after I said something. And the guy beside me looked at me and he was a big farm guy, huge guy. And he stood up and he realized that he too would be standing for the next three hours. And he looked at me and he said, well, this is going to be about as much fun as a gut full of pinworms. And... That line is how I wrote, that's what started Godless But Loyal to Heaven, one of my famous novellas in the collection, Godless But Loyal to Heaven. So I don't know this gentleman's name. I am forever grateful. If you, sir, are the person who said it, you're hearing this, a thousand thank yous, a thousand thank yous. I'll buy you a buffalo roast from the farmer's market here in Edmonton. So with writing, you can borrow, you can beg, you can steal, and most of the time, you're okay because you're never going to see this person again. When it comes to storytelling, there's what I believe to be a life debt. So what that means is when you go to an elder or you go to a knowledge keeper or a culture keeper, the custom is to, to bring tobacco and the custom is to bring gifts and the custom is to bring food. And it could be something that you've made. It could be a brand new coffee mug with some berries. It could be something that's meaningful to you, where you're from. So, for example, I'm giving a big talk in to Six Nations, uh, to a school in Six Nations, and uh, they're sending me maple syrup that the students have collected themselves. So there's protocol where you are you're honoring an elder. So I pay everyone in the book and gather, or I pay everyone that I always I transcribe because. There are a lot of pensioners out there who are raising their grandbabies. And there's gas money, you know, there's supper after, etc. So with me, because this is my profession, I have no problem paying elders for whatever it is that they want to share with me. But it's also about the gifts. It's also about the tobacco. It's also about the medicines. It's also about bringing people buffalo meat or caribou meat or moose meat. But not just once. For life, Tommy. Okay. For life. So Thompson Highway can write to me and say, hey, I've got a nephew in Edmonton. He's going to uh, Athabasca U. Uh, Is there any way you could just um, pay him a visit? Well, Thompson Highway gave us the most beautiful story for Gather, and I've known Thompson for 20, 30 years. 
Well, with that nephew, I have a debt to Thompson for all he's ever given me, all the laughs, all the visits, all the times he's invited me to tour. I owe him the world. For life, I will give as much as I can, all I can. Because, Tommy, why wouldn't you want to leave this planet being remembered as somebody who gave all they could and came back and gave even more? That's why we're here. So if you're going to go to an elder, if you're going to go to a knowledge keeper, bring gifts, bring tobacco, bring food. And even if you're maybe shy around money, why not give them a, a $50 gift card to Timmy's or give them a $50 Visa card or do you know what I mean? Like we walk in two worlds now, the ancient and this one. So I always love to honor and just and cherish and uplift and it's pretty hard to stay mad at somebody if they're going to keep feeding you, right? Yeah. And honoring you and they bring you beautiful buffalo meat and moose meat and berries and sage and sweet grass and rat root. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Giving has its own reward. Absolutely. I mean, you know, and when it comes to me and my music, there is really not very much money in the music business anymore, you know, mm -hmm. unless you get really, really lucky. There's only, you know, the top 100 artists in the world that are actually making a lot of money and they can live off that for infinity, whatever. But the fact of the matter is people need music in their lives. And yep. I don't expect to recoup my investment in studio time and manufacturing anytime soon. But when people want the music, I'm going to give them the music. And that's, that's a way that I can give back to the people in my life and the people need something to smile about, you know, mm -hmm. so I get you, man. I get you. I just want to touch quickly on uh, Moccasin Square Gardens. Mm -hmm. the, I think it's the very first short story in that book uh, about Jimmy, who works in a hardware, and he lives upstairs in an apartment. Oh, aliens. You he, like aliens. Well, and he, he has a date with this young girl, and um, it, young it has a surprising kind of climax, and I'm wondering... Where did you get the inspiration to create this character? Or is this somebody that was like from real life or, or what? Well, you know, it's, that short story is called Aliens, and it's from Moccasin Square Gardens, which was published by Douglas and McIntyre. So my editor was Barbara Pulling and Cheryl Cohen, but Barbara and I hadn't worked together in 23 years. She was my first editor for The Lesser Blessed. And uh, she's only gotten tougher, only gotten sharper, and she only uses a pencil, Tommy. She only uses a pencil, and she's thorough. But Aliens is, yes, it's about a, a gentleman who never left his community. He runs the hardware store, and uh, one day he asks one of the customers that he's known her entire life, and she's, she thought she knew him her entire life, and they go on a date, and she realizes she doesn't know anything about him at all, and he's, he's quite magical. And I, I don't want to give too much away, but I think... As a writer, the most important question you, you can ask is, what if? What if someone you grew up with your whole life, you had no idea just how sacred they were, and they could welcome you into a whole new realm of being? Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. You know, I don't think I have any more questions for you, Richard. It's been great having this conversation, but what I like to do is to give my guests the last word. So if there's something that you really feel passionate about that you want to share with the people, why don't you do that? Well, I'm just grateful to be here, Tommy. You can call me any old time. I mean, I grew up with your wife and, you know, we had the best childhood in Fort Smith, Northwest Territories. You know, when we were growing up in the 70s, we had uh, the Bay City Rollers they had their hit Saturday night, and the Kiss Army was mobilizing. And I was raised in a time when, uh, oh, yeah, I saved all my money for the, the patch, Kiss Army patch and the iron-on from Destroyer. And then remember when uh, Deet, what was that, that muscal? I remember putting muscal on my shirt out in Pine Lake and my arms and my legs because we were going swimming. And the Deet was so strong and toxic and illegal, it melted the faces off of Gene and Paul and Chris and Ace, oh, it was, I wept. I actually cried all the way back to Fort Smith because I was so proud to be part of the, you know, the Kiss Army. Kiss Army, and, yeah, yeah. But growing up in Smith, we were raised in a time of storytelling and visiting and sleepovers and sliding. 
you know, the landslide and the, we uh, used to drive our skidoos to high school and my brother had a little trap line. He never caught anything, but we'd always check his little traps after school and we'd all race home at 4.30 because Degrassi Junior High was on. And we had HBO and, you know, Cinemax and the new TNN. And we were raised in a time with Aliens and Predator and uh, Terminator and Star Wars. So we had the best of the South. We had pop culture, right? Degrassi Junior High, et cetera, et cetera. Good rockin' tonight with Stu Jeffrey, right? Yeah. We were great Canadians, and we were also great Northerners, too. And when I look back on my life, I mean, I've had such a wonderful life, and I continue. I'm 49. I've never been happier. And, yes, we've all sacrificed so much with this pandemic, but we will get through this. All storms pass. And uh, if you've got a community that you love and you don't see it, get out there and create it. You know, like I run my own little Star Wars Micro Machine and Micro Collection Facebook group, but I spend way more time on the other ones. To speak to other collectors and to ask for help with your collection, it just gives you that little extra magic every day. And, you know, for me to reconnect with the Sisters of Mercy and the Mission, to fall in love with my own music collection again, that's really been the gift of this pandemic is looking around, taking stock and saying, how do I want to come out of this? What am I going to change about my life? And here's what I'm going to do, Tommy. I'm not getting on a plane three times a month like I, like I used to. I think it's disgusting I used to do that. I can't imagine what that did for my wife and my little boy, you know, for me to do that. And yes, I had a you know book a year. And yes, I was touring. And yes, I was promoting. But I think a whole lot of that was ego and a paycheck. But now, with this pandemic, you can Zoom for an hour, make some money, and then put supper on and, you know, read to your boy and, and go to bed at a decent hour. Do you know what I mean? Like, we're home now. And you've got to think globally, when we come out of this, for a guest artist to say, I will perform for you in my own studio, in my own home. As a host, you don't have to pay for taxi, per diems, missed flights, hotels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, so many of us love working from home. So many of us have the ability to work from home. And I think Zoom and, and Google Meets and every other platform out there has really shown us that the day of the big commute, hopefully, maybe it doesn't always have to be this way. And maybe we don't always have to be so busy because I think busy was supposed to mean happy. And what this showed was busy was showing us just how exhausted and tired we were. So when you come out of the storm, I hope everybody listening comes out on their own terms with new dreams, new goals, and with new medicines. So use this time to get what you need, whether it's family recipes, family stories, bring back those family names, recording your elders, etc., etc., etc. All storms pass. It's not fair what we've been through. It's not been fair to anybody. It was just our turn. Sage words of advice. That's great. Joe. That's great. Well, Richard, I thank you very much for being on the show. Uh, Jimmy Thanks, Sonny. And until next time, cheers. Cheers. Masi Cho. Sagya Masi. All the best, everybody. Keep it up. One day at a time, one sunrise at a time. Okay, I got to go. What an interesting man Richard Van Camp is. RichardVanCamp.com and Richard Van Camp at SoundCloud. That's where you go to find out everything and anything that you want to know about Richard and his many, many books. He's written graphic novels, children's books, comic books, uh, short stories. He's had several movies produced that were based on his books. Anyway, it's all really good. It's all really cool. And in honor of Richard's indigenous roots, here is my award-winning cover of the Redbone Classic, which was really a tribute to the Indigenous People of Canada when I recorded it, used with permission from the National Music Publishers Association, Inc., license number 127298702, all rights reserved. Come and get your love. Enjoy.
Tommy Solo's Famous Friends is a one-man production, meaning that I've done all the work, including producing, editing, guest acquisition, etc. All rights reserved. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The theme song for Tommy Solo's Famous Friends was written and recorded by Tommy Solo with a little help from my friends in the night crew. And hey, if you like the show, why not subscribe? Until next time, cheers.